right. Uh, this is our fourth week in the book of Joel. So if you're a guest here this morning, we're in this series called Little Big Shots, five uh, minor prophets in the Old Testament. Again, books that we're not as familiar with, probably don't read them that much. And we're starting with Joel. Uh, in two weeks, we'll be starting. Andrew will be doing a series in Obadiah. That'll be the next book for us. So we have one more week in Joel after, uh, after this one. And if you're trying to say, okay, where's Joel? And so maybe you're like, I mean, I'm just, I'm new here. Um, where do you start? I picked up one of those borrowed Bible things. And, but where do you start? Well, go to your, just go to the beginning. You'll find an index. You can find Joel that way. Or go about three quarters of the way through your Bible. So just look for it. Uh, and actually, for those of you who've been Christians for 30 years, you probably don't know where it is either. So uh, you're, you can start your, your, your discovery and your journey to find it as well. Um, in Joel, we have seen God's judgment for his people's sins, and it's not God's judgment to the world. It really was God's judgment uh, on his people for their disobedience. And as we saw, it was a severe discipline and a painful discipline. It was actually a discipline that, that actually threatened lives, their, their ability to survive because of this locust, this plague of locust and drought that followed. So it was a severe discipline and a painful discipline which is instructive, discipline, when we're in it, tends to be painful. But that discipline, that severe discipline, was intended to rescue them and to bring them back to God. And that is always the point of discipline. God wants to redeem. So here's this severe discipline to Israel. Why? It's not to punish them and to put their nose in it. It's to call them back. They have walked away from the giver of life. Their only hope, the only thing that was true, the rock, their refuge, they had left God to pursue other gods. And so God in mercy disciplines them to call them home, to call them back as he does to us. So we saw the discipline of God. We also saw the call for genuine heartfelt repentance, not just doing religious duty, but a heart that would mourn and weep for the sins that they had committed. And it saw this call for repentance, and, and really the hope of the repentance is this. Our hope for repentance is based in the grace and mercy of a loving God. You know, how do you know if you offend a king Imagine offending a person of power. How do you know how they'll respond if you come back? Well, here's how we know our God responds. He responds with mercy and grace because he is a loving God. Even to those that can be rebellious and indifferent to him. And then last week we saw God's promise of restoration. And it was abundant restoration. God is generous, not only in his forgiveness, he is generous in his blessing to the repentant. That's where we are. So if you're here for the first Sunday, that's where we are in Joel. So this morning, we're going to be looking at two great promises at the end of Joel chapter 2, two great promises to God's people. Both of these promises are repeated in the New Testament. So these are significant promises for the New Testament. They are fulfilled in Jesus Christ, which again shows you what? The Bible's one story. It's all predicting something, looking to something, going someplace, and then being fulfilled. So these two great promises will be repeated in the New Testament, and both are fulfilled through Jesus. I've entitled this morning's message, Great Promises to Great Sinners. And may that give you hope. God has great promises to ruin people, to people who have made a mess of their life, to people who have actually sinned against the God they love. And yet he has great promises to great sinners. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. Follow along with me. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. 
Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great an awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Let's pray. Lord, please bless the reading of your word. And please now bless this preacher as he seeks to preach your word. Help me in my weakness to bring your truth to your people for their benefit. Lord, please encourage us today. Please strengthen us today. Lord, please plant the truth of your word in our hearts today that it might bear good fruit. Lord, I ask that you would do these for the glory of your son, the glory, the good of your people, the advance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. It has been said that promises are only as strong as the person who gives them. Promises are only as strong as the person who gives them, and that is a true statement. Now, unfortunately, we live in a world of broken promises, don't we? Politicians break their promises. People break promises. Their promises. Employers can break their promises. We live in a world of broken promises. We live in a world where at times people overpromise and underdeliver. Have you lived in that world at all? Overpromise, underdeliver. And actually, when that happens, that has an effect on us, doesn't it? Whether people Overpromise and under, underdeliver, or they break a promise. They have made a promise. And by the way, the closer that person to you is, the more hurtful that is. When a promise is broken by someone you trust, that can hurt us, it can tempt us, it can make us jaded to the world. But God is not like man. God is not like man. He does not overpromise and underdeliver. I can guarantee you here this morning, God will never promise more than he can fulfill. He will not overpromise. He's not going to ever sell you a bill of goods and not deliver. There's not going to be that like, man, when I looked at it at the catalog, it appeared it would be like this. And now it's like this. You'll never have that moment where, my word, you know, on TV, this burger looked like this, and now I've gone to that fast food place, and it has not, they're not even in the same world. Where's that rich, juicy burger? This looks like a piece of cardboard painted gray, left out in the sun. God is not like man. He does not overpromise and underdeliver. He never breaks his word to us ever. And everything he promises, he can perform. He never has a regret of, boy, I said more And now in retrospect, I don't think I can fulfill what I said. There's no circumstance that can come to God that can inhibit him to complete and fulfill his promise. 
I said I would do this. I would be there for you. I just didn't know this was going to happen. Something's happened that has precluded me to be with you, to be close to you. I said I would never forsake you or leave you, but I didn't know this was going to happen. And I had to turn my attention somewhere else, so therefore I couldn't be with you in that moment. Oh, no, no. He can perform every one of his promises. And he will never leave you or forsake you if you are in him. Even when we are prone to wander to leave the God we love, he pursues over and over again. Brothers and sisters, this text gives us two great promises. Two astounding promises. Now, before we get to the promises, let's remember who are these promises made to and when were they made? Who are these promises made to and when were those promises made? Well, they're made to people who were, had been unfaithful to God and had lived in disobedience to God. This was not a promise to a friend. This was not a promise to someone who was bringing joy to your life. It's not that kind of promise. This is a promise given to people who had been in rebellion, who had treated God as though he didn't exist, who were indifferent to him, who actually loved other gods. That's who this promise was made to. People who had not only this this generation, but this, this whole tribe of people, this whole people group, they had a history of what? Wandering from God to only respond when they were in trouble. Just read through the Old Testament, judge after judge after judge. It's just one cycle after another. The people prosper, God blesses them. The people forget God, he then disciplines them. Now they're in distress, they cry out to God, he comes back and delivers them. Then he gives them prosperity, and then they do it again. The history here is of people that are not like, wow, we're just all in for God all the time. That is their history as a nation, and that was the history of this generation. So, oh, these promises, they're, they're made to messy people, to ruined sinners, people who had wandered from God, people that were in trouble. In other words, these promises were made to people that we would tend to give up on, Right? We would give up. We would only look at justice. What you deserve is what you're going to get. After all I've done for you, after the mighty deeds I've done, you will only get what you deserve. Folks, that's how we tend to react. How would we react to this? Well, you're going to get what you deserve, but God is unlike us. And he gives them what they don't deserve. And he actually makes great promises to great sinners. So let's look at these two great promises. Promise number one is God promises his spirit to his people. God promises his spirit to to his people. Look at verses 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And the young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants In those days, I will pour out my spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, right, God's always been a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. They live in fellowship together, which means they know what loving relationships look like. That's why they invite us into a relationship, not to create one for themselves. They already had one, but to invite us into a relationship. But in the Old Testament, we more see God referred to as Lord and Father. And there's not as much of the Spirit's known and seen activity. And when we see the Spirit, what happened in the Old Testament, the Spirit, the Spirit would come upon a person, not the entire nation, but a person. The Spirit would fall upon a person, usually to empower them to do something 
or to say something. So it was selective. So the period would, you know, we think about this, it would come upon Samson and he would be imbued with great strength to do great deeds. Upon a prophet, to do great strength, to do great deeds. Upon prophets who declared something great. The Spirit would come upon them and move. But it was usually only to a person and usually not forever. The Spirit would come, the Spirit would go. And so one of the, the great things in the Old Testament that the people of Israel looked forward to is when will the Spirit come and indwell all of us? Well, here it's prophesied. There's going to be a time, it's not just going to come on David and Samson or Gideon or Elijah or Isaiah. It's not just going to come on on leaders. There's going to be a time that the Spirit of God is going to come to all people. Pour it out on everyone. And do you see how inclusive this is? And there's two big inclusivity statements in this. In these two promises. Who does the Spirit pour it out on? Well, on pastors, on leaders, on the gifted. No, on all flesh. Your sons, daughters, old men, servants, male and female servants. In other words, the Spirit of God is going to be poured out on the unexpected. On everyone. It is an inclusive blessing. Folks, this is the text that Peter quotes in Acts 2. So if you went to Acts 2, and we're not going to go there this morning, but if you go into Acts 2, and, and when the Spirit, this is what they're waiting for, right? Jesus says, now look, don't leave Jerusalem. Don't leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you with power. This is the great high priestly priestly prayer in John uh, 14 through 16. You know, he's praying for the comforter to come. He's saying, it's better that I leave, that the Holy Spirit comes, and I'm going to send my spirit. And then he tells them to wait. And they are waiting These guys that basically right now don't have much going for them. They're waiting. Oh, they've seen the crucified Christ, the resurrected Christ. They know that. They've seen the ascension of Christ. That was not enough. You would say, what else do you need to see? I mean, you saw a dead person alive and you saw him taken to heaven. Isn't that enough? (laughs) I mean... What other proof do you need? That, that should be enough precept just in your precepts, in your mind, to say, well, I know, it's, I know it's true. I know he died. He was buried. And he was raised. We ate with him. We spoke with him. We touched him. And then we saw him taken to heaven. Let's go. Wait until the spirit comes. And the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, the Spirit comes upon that room, unexpected, falls upon them like a mighty wind, tongues of fire, and they go out. They immediately go out into the community, and Peter preaches. The Spirit's poured out on the church, and please understand, it wasn't just poured out on a person, it wasn't just Peter, it was the church. It was the gathered people of God, which also speaks to the importance of our gathering. God's not just talking about individuals. The church gathered. He pours his spirit out. And throughout Acts, we see when the church is gathered together, worshiping God, the spirit fills the room. And then they go out with boldness again. Poured out on everyone, every person, not just leaders, not just the gifted, not just the prominent, but all people. Oh, brothers and sisters, why is this important? Well, this is the very presence of God. As God looks and says, oh, the people that I love, the people that I purchased, the people that I care about, the people that will live with me forever, the people that I've entrusted with my message, entrusted us next week on Summer Blast to share the gospel. It'll be shared in song and through words, 
But what about our interactions? I'm entrusting these people with the most precious message, the most important message in history. So what's the best thing I can give them right now? Not a manual, myself. I'll give them my spirit. I will put my spirit within them. They will become the temple of the living God. So I think about the temple being filled. What happened? It's filled with glory. And there's something that happens within us as God gives us his very presence. And then what does the spirit do for us? Oh, brothers and sisters, right? how many messages could be in here? He comforts us. The Holy Spirit comforts us. I will send you a comforter. He comforts. How often do we need comfort? There are moments God, and by the way, anytime you receive comfort, I believe the author of comfort is God. The means of comfort is often people. God will send someone to you. Someone that cares for you. Maybe they weep with you. Maybe they encourage you. God will send people and you will feel their love. And you will look at them and and say, thank you. Please understand there's a greater face behind them. There's a face of your God who sent them. And your God's comforting you through them. That's the, the spirit of God's working. He comforts us. He helps us. This week... Many of you are going to be strengthened to serve with the, with the grace God gives. First Peter talks about we serve with the strength the Spirit gives. And so we serve with that. He helps us. He guides us. He, what, what's next? What do we do next? He illuminates truth. And folks, illumination of truth is not mere intellectual study. It's not sitting there saying, okay, perceptually, I understand that that was a locust thing. You know, chapter one was locust, okay? I understand this part of the Bible, okay? I understand this. It's not just intellectual knowledge. That's not what's happening in illumination. Illumination goes to our hearts. It makes sense. Not only does it make sense, it's precious. Folks, if you understand God's word and it is precious to you, That is the work of the Spirit. Because I venture to say this. We could bring in smarter people to read the same word and they wouldn't get it. I could bring someone in who might say, I can take your thoughts and write a far better speech, far more entertaining and grabbing with far better illustrations and more humor sewed in, and yet wouldn't get it. And we would understand they don't get it. Why? Because the Spirit illuminates us to truth. Every time you read the Bible and understand it, something supernatural has happened to you. If you wonder, oh, where's the Spirit in my life? Do you love God's Word? Do you understand it? Is it precious? That's the Spirit of God. That's the Spirit of God. He comforts, helps, guides, illuminates. He empowers us. May we be empowered by the Spirit next week in Summer Blast. May you be empowered the next time you are at a restaurant and you are engaging a waitress or waiter. May you be empowered in your neighborhood. May you be empowered at school. May you be empowered at your job and for some of you just starting your jobs. New jobs for younger people. May you be empowered in those settings to be a witness. Sent out to do far more than just earn a paycheck. To learn a subject matter. To play a sport. To enjoy a meal. May you be empowered by the Spirit. to be a witness. And then what else the Spirit does? He gifts us. He gifts us. The gifts of the Spirit function. So what happens sometimes at the mic? Somebody's feeling a prompting by the Spirit 
to share something that they hope will edify, comfort, or encourage. It should be grounded in spiritual truth, sound doctrine. It's only an impression. We don't vest it with authority. But someone is saying, I believe the Spirit of God is leading me to share. And if we're humble, that's how we evaluate and receive. The Spirit of God gives gifts. And those gifts are moldable. 1 Corinthians 12 was not meant to be a limitation. It's just meant to be an expression of multiple, 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 multiple gifts. And some are the more what we call spectacular gifts. Healing, words. And other people are like, yeah, all I do is just really help set up an ministry. That's a gift of the Spirit. And you're like, you know what, I just want to help. That's a gift of the Spirit. Do you understand? That's a gift of the Spirit. I just want to help people. How can I help when some are blessed? How can I administrate something over here? How can I serve over here? Those are all gifts of the Spirit. May we celebrate the manifest expressions of the Spirit and not just the spectacular ones. God promises his Spirit to his people, even people like this. And this promise was fulfilled in Acts 2 and has been being fulfilled Every moment since Acts 2. God has fulfilled this promise. If you're a Christian here today, God has fulfilled this promise in your life. He has given you his spirit to accomplish all that spirit wants to accomplish. He has fulfilled his promise and he pours out his spirit. It's not small. We're poured out. Folks, we need the spirit. And please understand, if you say, I want more. Warren, how do I get more of the Spirit? Here's this. It's going to be brilliant. Ask. It's really deep theology. You're glad you came to church to hear that. Ask. Ask. And how do I know that? Listen to Luke chapter 11, verse 13. If you then, who are evil. And the point here is he's making a comparison. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Don't earn it. Ask Him. Don't feel they have to qualify for it. They ask Him. Believing that He is a good Father. So all we have to do is ask. Folks, what a great promise to great sinners that they would get the Holy Spirit of God. Second, God promises to save those who call on his name. God promises to save those who call on his name. Look at verse 32. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now again, please understand the context of verse 32 is uh, verses or verse 31 is verses 30 and 31. So there is a context for this. It is final judgment. And he's talking about this. There's going to be wonders in the heavens and earth, blood and fire, columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Now, let's not interpret the next red moon as what it means. Like, here's what it's saying. There's going to be chaos. There's something happening. Before, and what's the day of the Lord? The great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Folks, this is not the great and awesome like, yay, this is... This is judgment. This is how they understood it. The day of the Lord is the day of judgment. It's the day of reckoning. It's when God says, yeah, now it's account time. And all excuses washed away. It's you and me face to face. And you will face me. And those apart from Christ will be judged. This is not a trite thing. 
This is the pictures of Revelation. Of, oh my, what a king that returns. Not not child, not meek, not humble now. He is coming with a sword. He is coming in glory. And he is coming with judgment and justice. And words like vengeance are used. And saints that were killed by the wicked crying out, oh, they're going to be vindicated on that day. Those that have been hurt are going to be vindicated on that day. Oh, it is the day of the Lord, the day of final judgment. And there's chaos. But God, this is, this is a serious day. And it's within that. This is, these verses and their understanding, we don't get this as well. Because we don't really, our country doesn't live with a great fear of God. For them, they got it. This is tremble time. This is the day of the Lord. There's going to be chaos in the world. The day of the Lord. What will happen? And then we have this amazing promise. We'll just call. Verse 32, it shall come to pass. In that day of the Lord, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And as we see the fulfillment of verses 28 through 29 in Acts 2, this Paul quotes in Romans 10, 13. Paul takes this text, and actually more, I'm just taking one of the verses, takes this, and in 10, 13, here's what Paul writes, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Both of these texts are referenced in the New Testament. And folks, please notice what it says. You are, you call, you'll call and be saved, not work and be saved. It's not those who work for the Lord will be saved. Not those who merit saving will be saved. It's those who call on the Lord will be saved. Folks, think about this. How does calling save us? Why does calling save us? It sort of seems cheap. I'll live my life. Call out. Hmm. Seems a little too easy. Why does calling save? Well, here's, if you understand it, it's an expression of faith in God and not in self. This is what the thief on the cross did. It wasn't, hey, I got away with a lot, and the last minute I get eternal life. He came to a realization, I had lived for myself my entire life. And even at this moment, when I can do nothing, I can do nothing to atone for my sin, nothing to make my life better. I can do nothing to make up for anything. I don't have, I can't do one good work, not one good deed. I can't go back and say sorry to anyone. Here's what I can do. I can say, please, today, save me. And he was saved. Folks, it's an expression of faith in God, not in self. Folks, we are not saved by self-improvement projects. It's what the world will tell you. Prove, prove. And surely you want to grow. But you're not saved by self-improvement projects, and you're not saved by good works. Otherwise, there was no hope for that thief on the cross. He had moments before he was going to die. Moments. But here's what faith does. It's an expression of faith in God, not in self. Faith looks to Jesus and says, he died for my sin and he was raised for my justification. He died for my sin. Oh, I believe that. And I believe every aspect of that statement, that I am a sinner, I was hopeless, I was ruined, nothing I can do, but I look to him. And I call on him and say, here's what I've got, nothing. But I believe you died for me.
I believe I deserve what you took. So I throw all my confidence on you. I believe you accomplished it all. Oh, what words to the sinner's ears. It is finished. Oh, I don't bear the weight of having to be a good enough person to make it to heaven, to make up for my mistakes, to make it to heaven. He saves those who call on his name. We look to his sacrifice and his triumph and we say, save us. Folks, please notice this as well. As the giving of the Spirit was generous and inclusive, was not it generous and inclusive? All flesh, sons, daughters, old men, young men, male, female, servants, the unexpected. Yeah, I can see maybe for the children, maybe for this, but for servants? Servants are going to get filled with the Spirit? Servants? Really? Yes. Servants are going to be filled with the Spirit. The church is going to be filled with the Spirit. You have the Spirit in you. Generous, inclusive. And then look at this. Who? Who? It's the same thing. As the giving of the Spirit was generous and inclusive, so is this call. Who calls upon the name of the Lord and will be saved? Everyone. Everyone. What about my ethnic group? Don't feel accepted in many places in the world. It just depends where you go. What about that? What about my background? All the what ifs. Them? This is a generous and inclusive call. Who has saved those who call upon the name? Young people, old people. This should be our prayer. Oh, the souls we have in children's ministry right now. Souls. And folks, apart from grace, they are cute but lost souls. Make no mistake. If you are with children long enough, you realize how lost they are. There's many cute moments. There's other moments you're like, oh my. This child would kill someone if they were able. <laughs> right? And it would, me first. Like they would, be, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, you watch children, they walk by, and there's a child, interesting playing, and then just some, the other child just walks by, boom, wipes them out. Why? Because I could. Because I want to dominate, I want to rule, and you are my servant. And so I can do whatever I want with you. That's sibling love. Those precious children, let's pray that not one be lost. Not one. And our love's not a love. Our love will not save them. God needs to save them. They need to call out to God. And let's pray they do that at a young age. Right? So they have, their testimony is, let me tell you what I was saved from. A life of drugs, a life of this, a life of that, a life of this. And you say, wow, did you have all those things? No, God saved me before I did any of those things. Amen. Right? Anybody want to go back to those sinful days and say, well, yeah, it's a great testimony. But you don't sit there and say, and it was fun. No, I wish I had never, none of that had happened. Oh, let's pray for our children. Young parents, your soul, their souls. Pray, you can't, your love can't save them, your training can't save them, only God saves. And they, some at point in their life, need to just call out, and they can do that at, at, at a young age. Oh, this world's warring for them. Do we have a roaring lion outside? Think about if we physically had a roaring lion outside, and we were told, police came into this building right now and said, hey, Something happened. There was, a, there was a circus that went by and the trucks broke down and, and, and it turned over and the lions and the, and the leopards are loose and they're loose in your neighborhood and you got all these woods around, the, around your property. There's lions around. We're not here yet because we got catastrophe all over. How would you walk out the door? How would you let your children, hey, mom and dad, we want to go out and play? No. There's a lion. Folks, there's a lion. 
for our children. Let's pray for our children. God, protect them from the evil one. Our children, our grandchildren, Lord, generations. And by the way, those of you with small children, you're not thinking about this day yet. Someday you're going to have grandchildren. Pray that your children love Christ so they will raise your grandchildren, which will be a great delight to your heart, that they will love Christ as well. Generation to generation. Young, who, who calls upon the name of the Lord when we say, well, young people, old people. You might say, oh, my The clock's ticking on my life. It is on mine. The clock's ticking. Boy, a lot of a lot of water under this bridge. Too late. Wasted a lot of time. Call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. When I'm 70. It's a long time. I've lived a long way. I've done it my way a long time. You're at the funeral with Bob's, for Bob's dad. Bob's dad got saved later in life. And boy, didn't he live for Christ. Boy, he made all those remaining years count for Jesus. It's not too late. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Young, old, single, married. Oh, yeah. Churches are always about married folks. You know what? Single folks here, oh, man, I I think singles, you you are the point of the spear. You're the future. Single, married, saved. What if you, I just don't feel much about myself. Came in there, I just don't feel worthy. I just sort of feel, eh, I'm an end person. Eh. It's not that other people make me feel that way. I, I feel that way. Where do I fit? I just feel, eh. About myself. I, I'll walk around with a happy face, but inside, I'm thinking loser, loser, loser. How about for you? You know, call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. You're hurting. Oh, I'm hurting. Life hurts. Call upon the name of the Lord. And it's not, for some, it might be, I feel guilty. Well, maybe you feel guilty because you are. You know, we, we so quickly want people to say, don't feel bad about yourself. Maybe you should. That's where it starts. Christ died for our sin, not our goodness. So, man, I, I feel guilty. Well, maybe because you are guilty. And here's the good news. Call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. And your guilt, cast away. I'd encourage you, if you've never read Pilgrim's Progress, just even the first beginnings of it, when Pilgrim has this massive weight on his, on his back and it bows him over and he's, but it's like normal life because everybody has the weight. And then he goes through the gate, represents the cross, and he goes to the pit And his weight falls off into the abyss and he never sees it yet again. Call upon the name of the Lord regardless of your guilt. And you know what, folks? No matter how big your pile is, we're just comparing piles at that point. Not sure everybody's going to get there and say, you know what? My pile had one less pound than your 100-pound pile. I only had 99 pounds on my back. We're all burdened, heavy laden. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. You will be saved. Just call, cry out to God and he will save. And folks, this is, this is a heartfelt, this is not words. This is those that lament, mourn, and weep over their sin. And then they call out, they do that in a sense, there's nothing I can do. But I can I can call. I can't be great. Can't do great things. Don't think I'm a super gifted person, but I can call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. I want to close with these verses from Psalm 107. Psalm 107, if it's 
It's one of my favorite psalms, if not my favorite psalm. And if you ever find your place in a desperate place, find yourself in a desperate place, I, I commend Psalm 107 to you. I have read it many of time. I have shared it many of time. Psalm 107, I'm not reading all of it, but verses 4 through 22, it will be extensive. And just see if you find yourself in here. Some wandered in desert waste, finding no way to a city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. This is all they do. They cry, they call, they cry to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and the shadow of death prisoners in affliction and in irons for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Do you understand why these people are in turmoil? They put themselves there. This is not something that happened to them. It happened because of them. Look where they are. Darkness, death, prisoners, irons, shadow of death. Because why? They had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Oh, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts into the bars of iron. Right? He breaks you out of prison. Some were fools through their sinful ways, again, for their own fault. Some were fools through their sinful ways. And because their iniquities suffered affliction, they loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. And let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving And tell of his deeds and songs of joy. Folks, what is the result of when we cry out to the Lord and ask to be saved? Well, here's the result. We have sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we will tell of his deeds with joy. Penning of our sin, turning to Christ will not limit you will not hinder your joy. It will, it will empower, expand your joy, and you will sing with joy, telling of the deeds of the Lord. Oh, brothers and sisters, what great promises to great sinners. You're here this morning. You want to know where do I stand? How do I stand? Is it for me? If you can cry out to the Lord, you will be saved. And you know what else? He will give you his spirit. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for grace that is amazing. 
Thank you that you're the God of grace and mercy and loving kindness, of steadfast love to us. Lord, thank you that in Joel, in the midst of significant judgment, to rebellious people, people indifferent to you, people who love things above you in light of those people, in light of your discipline to them, in light of your promises of restoration, you give these two great promises. Lord, you are no respecter of persons. You don't give this to the elite, the worthy. You give it to those who cry out and they will be saved and they will be filled. And then, Lord, we sing of your deeds. So, Lord, may we sing of your deeds going forward today. Let me sing of your deeds, God, this week at Summer Blast or at work or at school, in relationships, at games. God, may this great gospel that saves people like us be our great treasure above all other treasures. Lord, save our children and children's ministry. Save the generations yet to come. Save the lost in our community. May we be good news in our community because this is good news. People are carrying heavy weights. People are trying to convince themselves they're not guilty when they are guilty. It's not enough to cope. We need deliverance. We need salvation. And you have done it all. And all we need to do is call upon your name. God, thank you for texts like these. Thank you for grace like this. Thank you for our salvation, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.